<laughs> yes, this is Christmas, or at least this is the season that we talk about Christmas and the nativity and the immaculate conception and Jesus being born and fighting for the season of Santa Claus and family celebrating and enjoying this time of year. Or, for some, being depressed because of the time of year. It's interesting because if you think about this time of year, the winter as it is, the celebration that we choose to use for our own benefit is that with which we want to dedicate ourselves to the light, to light coming into the world. We're told that when Jesus came, that men preferred the darkness more than they preferred the light, lest they come to the light and their deeds be revealed for what they were. So at the time of the original Christmas, it wasn't one of everyone excited to see and to hear and to know what was going on. As a matter of fact, it was a very challenging time. Israel itself was occupied by Roman conquerors. They had pretty much introduced everything contrary to Jewish law. They had done things that were converting and subverting the people to a Greek way of thought. They were no longer Jewish, but they were more Hellenistic Jews. They had become commerce-driven. They were quite a bit like today's American Christian. We seem to be very much into the world. And though we are not of the world, we are in the world. And because we're in the world, we get involved in silly things like fighting for saying Merry Christmas. Who cares? <laughs> if you want to say Merry Christmas, say Merry Christmas. That's no big deal. There's no war on Christmas. When you want to advertise, then people get into the idea that they have to fight to advertise. You don't have to advertise anything. As a matter of fact, the very first Christmas had the biggest advertising slogan, the greatest advertising campaign in the world. Angels came and spoke to the shepherds who were guarding their sheep at night and spoke to them while they were watching their flocks and said, Behold, born unto you in this day in the city of David, a Savior, even Christ the Lord. And the gospel came out for the first time. The gospel was preached not to the entire world, but to shepherds, poor shepherds. And I kind of wonder, you know, what they thought once they saw where Mary and Joseph were and left. Because we know that during the nativity season, it wasn't so much that the wise men showed up on the night that Jesus was born. No, as a matter of fact, they probably showed up either a year later or somewhere between one and three years later. It could have been during the first year, but nobody knows. The fact is, there is nothing that says accurately within those three years when Jesus was born. And that's kind of interesting because the Catholic Church later on, when they were trying to keep track of the time of when Jesus was born, was off by about three years now, it's interesting that they were off about three years because at the same time, Herod, when Jesus was born, killed the children. All the children that were in that land up until three years were slaughtered. So in Bethlehem, there's a big gap when it comes to the children. They were all annihilated, which was kind of an interesting thing because if you think about this Christmas season, sometimes we sacrifice the joy of the Lord for the circumstances that we live in. You know how people are arguing about, you know, maybe even you've heard of it, you know, duck season in the midst of Christmas season, arguing about issues and trying to get caught up into the things of the world, you know, buying things, purchasing things. Maybe you're one of those people that gets caught up into that. And I feel sorry for you because really what Christmas is all about is whatever you make it about. <laughs> It doesn't have to be about Jesus. If you want to do Santa Claus, go do Santa Claus. I mean, it's an idea that we came up with in order to celebrate a time and a focus to turn our attention back to God because the season was so depressing that it was dark and a lot of things happened in darkness. But when light came into the world, we celebrate the light. And so this time of season should be joy-filled, but it's not always for everyone. Some people are hungry. Some people are thirsty. There's still starvation going on. There's still wars going on. There's still murder happening. As a matter of fact, you probably will hear of lots of different crimes and different things that are happening in your area or your city or your country or your nation. And the same thing was true when Jesus was born. You see, Jesus was born at a time when if Herod had found out 
where and when, he'd be dead. Because, quite frankly, within a few years or a few months, depending upon when it happened, Jesus had to flee from where he was. And the fact that he was born in a manger, I like to think of this message as being what happened the day after. Because we like to celebrate the night of the nativity, and we like to enjoy, you know, Christmas morning. But what happens the day after? You know, when the wife has to clean up all the Christmas wrap, you know, you got to kind of sooner or later take down the Christmas lights. You got to burn the Christmas tree. You know, you got to get rid of all the stuff that you had that you put up in order to celebrate. I would say be careful about your attitude during this time of season because that's when it's easy to mistake what the reason is for the season as opposed to what the season is and the reason. You see, God gave us seasons for a purpose, and he gave us reasons for those seasons. And winter is not the best time to get all excited. <laughs> as a matter of fact, if you're out driving in the snow, I would prefer you stayed calm. Because the message that was given was peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And that's kind of what I want to think about when we're looking at Colossians today. Think about peace on earth as opposed to what you still have to buy or what you have to purchase, what you have to do or what you have to get done. Try to think of the Prince of Peace who came in the form of a baby. I mean, how oh so vulnerable is there anyone that there could be on earth than God made vulnerable as a baby. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you know anything about God as being omniscient, as being the creator of all things, as being omnipotent, and that his son is the physical representation of God, what's that say about becoming a baby? Ooh, oh, ow, or, hmm. Just like one of the shepherds or one of the kings that visited from the east said, oh, how perfect. How perfect to have so beautiful a representation of the king of Israel to be born in a stable among poor people. And I kind of like to think of it that way at Christmas season. I like to think of the things that remind me of the simplicity and the humility of God to give up all divinity to come in the form of a human being and to die for our sins, to be brought into the world even as we are brought into the world to identify himself with ourselves and that's something that you should remember that God knows where you are God knows how you are God knows what you are but the fact when Jesus came we did not know who he was nor did we know how he was nor did we know what he was and the fact that God is love is what is so misrepresented so many times in Christianity that we need to remind ourselves often by looking at the scriptures and examining them to recognize God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That means that God so loved the homosexual, the child molester, the adulterer, the divorcee, the divorcee, the people that are ungodly, the people that are Christian, the righteous too, and even you and me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the fact that you see Hagar out in the desert, when she was cast out from the camp of Abraham, because of the fighting and the inner turmoil that Abraham couldn't deal with his consequences of sin anymore, that he put it far from him, God still looked down and heard the, the child. God was so consumed with the voice of the child crying that he heard Hagar's prayer and had mercy upon her. And that's what God wants to extend to all of us at this season. He doesn't want us to be caught up with the reason for the season. He doesn't want us to be lost in the world's ways and you know what we can get today or tomorrow or when Santa finally arrives. But he wants us to enjoy the fact that he's given us peace on earth, goodwill towards men. I like to think of the goodwill towards men as God's will toward men, because that's what God's will is for us. Peace on earth and peace with God. God provided peace for us in the person of Jesus Christ. 
when Jesus came and was born, from that moment on, there was the opportunity that eventually would be made known and we would see and understand that God is with us, that God could be in us, that God could be for us. And if God was in Jesus, being that he is the Son of God and that he is God himself personified in the flesh, then whether we understand the Godhead or not, whether we know the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as being contained in one and one in the three, it doesn't matter so much so that we realize the fact of the matter that God is in the flesh in Jesus. And because he was, he died for our sins and could take sin away from us. And then we could have peace with God. Because when we have peace with God, then we will bring peace on earth. Until then, there will be no peace. Jesus said, I come not to bring peace, but a sword for father would be against mother and mother against daughter because of his name. And oftentimes you'll find that quote unquote separation or division or sword between those that want to share the peace of God with those that want to ignore God. Because even as we know by the scripture telling us so that light came into the world, but men love darkness more than they love the light. So at the time of Mary and Joseph, at the time of Jesus being born, it was pretty tough. They couldn't find room in that city. They had to be pushed outside of the city into the stables or in the back of the city, so to speak, in the alley, you could say. Out where someplace there was a stable or someplace that they were keeping animals. And so, unfortunately, that's where Jesus was born. He was you could say, a street person. As a matter of fact, if you want to go out on the streets and see someone that's homeless, that's what Jesus was. Jesus was born homeless because he was not in the place of his birth. He had gone to a place to be registered to be born. Now they say that he grew up in Egypt because they left. They left for a while, they came back. They presented themselves in the temple, obviously, you know, at the time of the dedication of the child. But other than that, we don't know much about Jesus' childhood, except that he became Jesus of Nazareth because he was raised in Nazareth. Oftentimes, you find people on the street looking a little not so pleasant, not so cleaned up. I think that's what you want to identify Jesus as because you're going to find that the reality of being a homeless person is probably the way that Joseph and Mary and Jesus had to deal with until the wise men showed up and gave them frankincense myrrh. I was trying to think of the other one. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So they would have literally those things that people say what they identify him as. One of them is probably for his royalty and all that. Me personally, I think it was so that, you know, they could stink less, you know, because that's what it smells like, you know, in a stable, you know, so it smelled better. You know, and they kind of had practical things so that they could get out and get going to Egypt. They could literally live in Egypt until they were sent for and they could come back to Israel. So, it's interesting that there was a lot of things going on. I mean, if you take the story apart and you begin to examine all the different pieces, you see, guess what? It's like you today. It's a lot like all the things you need to get done for Christmas morning. You know, you want to present for your family something fun and enjoyable, and I'm sure that's the way Joseph felt. He wanted to provide for Mary, but he couldn't find any place, so he did the best he could. And guess where he wound up? In the alley. In the stables. You know, he wanted to, you know, probably provide for the baby in order to take care of him, but what could he do? He was a just man, but he had done the best that he could, being under the law. He had to obey the law. He had to do what the law required of him. He had to not say Merry Christmas, so to speak, because it wasn't that big a deal. The baby was the important part. He wanted to take care of Mary. And at that time that she was giving birth, I don't hear of a you know, anyone coming alongside like a uh, a nurse mother or a uh, a midwife. As a matter of fact, I think Joseph had to get his hands dirty, you know, and Mary give birth. You could say he got bloody. And so the fact of the matter is, is that it wasn't as beautiful and as wonderful as we make it out to be. It was probably a nitty gritty. But we celebrate the joy of what the shepherds saw. We celebrate the joy of what the three wise men saw. We celebrate the fact that this isn't the day he was born, but rather it was the way he was born <clears throat> that was the most important thing. God came for you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that his son volunteered to come into the world 
<clears throat> to be identified with you and I and to live inside of us eventually by way of his spirit. Because we can say now that God has come in the flesh, that he dwelt among us and we saw him as the image of the only begotten glory <clears throat> of God the Father. And we knew him not and we recognized him not. But when he revealed himself, then later we knew that we had seen God and lived. So I often am amazed that when you think about <clears throat> the fact of the story, when you think about the reality that this is our history, that this is who we are today, that today we are the nativity itself living and alive and walking around because God is in us. We have Jesus in us if we're born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit, <clears throat> that we can take this Christmas season and make it born again of something that is new, of that is joy-filled, of that is a celebration of life, that we have God's will, peace on earth, goodwill for men, that we can bring light into the darkness, that we can shine as the stars in the firmament, that we could be the salt of the earth, that we have a message to share, that God cares, and that we can be on the street into the highways and the byways telling those people that are out there, maybe homeless, maybe working at their jobs, maybe doing the things this season makes them do to provide for their family, that God knows, that God loves you. We can tell those that are already saved, like in Duck Dynasties or all these other places that they seem to have frustrations and aggravations this time of year, it's okay. It's okay. God is there. We can tell those that are making decisions to fire people or to hire people that are in the employment industry, that are giving jobs that, hey, I understand that the end is full. I know that there's no room for you. It's okay. We'll just go in the back and we'll have the Son of God, God himself, born there. Do you think the, inn, the innkeeper was treated like less of a person because there was no room? He just simply said, I got no room. That's all. He wasn't being mean or trying to make money off them. He just said, I don't have any room. We ought to be mindful of the season that we're in, that everywhere we go and everything we do is obvious to the angels in heaven. They will reveal themselves to you if you would just recognize that God is in sharing, declaring, and revealing his son. Even as he did this Christmas season, to shepherds who were tending their flocks at night. God will reveal his son to you today if you choose to serve him, to seek him, and to find him in a simple way. Not necessarily in a service or in a church, but, you know, maybe go out at night. Go about your job. Go about doing the things that you know you need to do, even if it's putting up Christmas lights or Christmas trees or Tinseltown or singing Charlie Brown or whatever it is you do at this time of the year. Just remember that God can reveal Jesus to you even in the midst of your job, in the midst of your work, wherever you are at work or in play, God is there. God wants to show you the way. He wants to open up the heavens just like he did with the shepherds and say to you, behold, your king has come. Your king is alive. Your king has been born in the city of David. And he is Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sins. You, if you don't know Jesus, can be saved from your sins. You can ask Jesus into your life and accept his free gift of salvation that the Father has provided for you. All you have to do is ask. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this season, if I could give you glad tidings of great joy, if I could give you good news from God our Father, then I'd like to share with you one thing and have you to think about when we get into, now that, you know, after saying this, we'll get into Colossians. Think about these things during this season. God has given you a precious gift, and that is his son. He who has the son has life. He who has not the son of God has not life. The greatest gift that God could give you, he did. He gave you a way to be saved. He gave you a person to be saved. He gave you the one you can call upon to be saved, and that is Jesus. So at this time of the season, a wonderful Savior, marvelous Counselor, wonderful Prince of Peace, think about the glad tidings of great joy that God has given you. The glad tidings and great joy is the fact that you can be saved. You don't have to go to hell. You can know like the shepherds know, like the three wise men found out, like Mary and Joseph learned, and we all discovered after Jesus rose from the dead. 
God has provided a way of salvation for all of us. We all need to be born again. So this Christmas, make your life dedicated in some way to God in somehow, some means, some form. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Because you can serve the Romans. You can serve the Christians. You can serve the church. You can serve your job. You can serve lots of things. But really, in all of these things, God wants to invade your world with the good news of his son and cause you to be born again wherever you are, however you are, the way that you are. Today, turn around and look up. Turn outside, inside out, and look up at the sky and open up your eyes and ask God to speak to you during the season to give you a little light. A little light that isn't generated by, you know, the Christmas tree lights or the world or whatever, but get alone, get in the dark somewhere, and then just ask God to speak to you. Because I have a feeling he's got something to say to you. And it may just be peace on earth, God's will toward men. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you that you brought us to this season. I thank you that <clears throat> this is the day that you have made. And we can look at Colossians and learn from those that were at Colossae, those that were inside the church, and those that were outside the church. That whether it be that which was, or that which is, or those which shall be, God, you speak to all of us, everywhere, always, and in every circumstance and situation that we find ourselves in, you have a will, you have a way. We delight to seek out your word so that we can understand the way we should go. Help us today to know you, Jesus. Father, I pray that you might reveal to you, or to us, your son, Jesus, that we might walk in his word, walk in his will, and walk in his way, Listening to the songs of joy that are sang today, but also listening to your heartbeat as you are so thrilled to have your son back home again after he spent some time here with us. Oh God, bring us home again to you and let us hear your heartbeat as we look at your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. I got to get some water real quick. <laughs> it's like, wow. We're a little blurry-eyed, and, you know, if you feel very uncomfortable about that, it'll be fixed next recording. But we wanted to record this early in the morning, because that's probably what it was like, you know, for Jesus at that time. You know, is that our lights aren't so bright, you know, the if I move my hands too fast, I think they blur. Yeah, they're blurry. But if I just stand still or be still, which is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so if I look a little stiff-necked, you know, that's why. Um, then... You know, the recording is fine because of the light apertures in the camera. And, you know, with Vidivo, we don't get professional. We don't want to be so professionally minded that we charge money. Or like I just recently ran into someone that I had to take exception with. You know, they were asking and begging for money at Christmas season. Their shortfall of their budget, you know. I mean, I understand that, you know. You know, same thing happened in Jesus' day. You know, they were, you know, shepherds, you know, shepherds were working, you know, and people were trying to get into where they had to, you know, be registered, you know, for their taxes, you know, and, you know, health care was getting, you know, just now put into place, or maybe that was Roman care, well, either way you look at it. But the point is, is that people were busy, so I understand people getting caught up in saying dumb things, but because they were begging for money, I had to remove them from the ministry that we do, you know, in, in promoting things, because one of the reasons we do things less than professional so we can do it freely. <laughs> now, if we have better equipment, we'll do better presentations of the gospel and of Jesus. But we're in Colossians, and looking at Colossians, it's just like any other home Bible study. They got together in the home. They got together as just a bunch of people that didn't have a full Bible. They didn't have Genesis through Revelation. As a matter of fact, they probably only had <clears throat> portions of what people had told them, what people had spoken together and gotten together. And that's why Paul was writing to them and speaking of their good works, because from what they knew, they had already developed into quite a reputation. And Paul had spoken to them and had talked about who he was, who they are, and what God was doing with them. And that's what's exciting is to realize that God is doing things with you that God is doing things in you, that God is accomplishing his purpose through your life and through the people around you in your life. 
And so looking at Colossians, <clears throat> we're in chapter 2, and we're going to read in verses 16 through 23. And normally we don't pay too much attention to verses and numbers because those are things that were added. We try to understand what the Spirit of God wants us to share together, to learn from Him. <laughs> That's my, my Jesus thing. But um, <clears throat> to learn from Him, I mean, really, if you bow your head and you put your hand up, you know, and you kind of do one of these things, hey, you know, you got it. I'm not a Tebow, but, you know, I got my own way of, you know, reminding myself to humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, He shall lift you up. But if we recognize that the early churches and these letters that are written are to people that have gotten together in order to understand God better, to share in the knowledge of who Jesus is and to look forward to his coming, then you begin to understand it's not so much about what we are today. Like we, we have the Bible. I mean, we have the entire full counsel of God. We have the beginning and the end. We know everything that's going on. And yet we're told that in the latter days, people would perish for lack of knowledge because they really wouldn't understand it. <clears throat> and that's kind of what happened when Jesus came the first time, was that Jewish scholars knew where he was going to be born. They knew roughly about the time, and yet they still ignored it. And Jesus is coming again soon, and we know that. There's no doubt about it. Israel became a nation in 1948. And, you know, it started previously before that, way, way back, you know, in the 1800s when... Theodore Herschel, you know, at the the um, council, World Zionist Council, declared, today we have become a nation. And from a Jewish perspective, they had. God had inspired Herschel to declare a nation. And the same flag, the same songs, the same structure, everything that was pretty much set up in the 1800s, and then they began to send out missionaries, so to speak, or people to the land to convert the land, just like they did in Nehemiah's day, they went back to Israel to purchase property from the Turks and from the Arabs and from the Muftas and the Molos and the, everyone else that was there at the time. And they purchased swamp land and they began to plant trees and they were scientists from Russia and they were botanists from Germany and they were people from all over, you know, scientific community that were not religious, but they were going back to Israel in order to build a nation. And so at that time, we know that God began to work with the people that he had called by his name, the Jewish nation, the children of Israel, the children that were of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he had pulled out from Chaldea, that he or had pulled out from Ur, the Chaldees. And so it's not about, you know, there were some perfect people that had started from Genesis and worked their way through to Revelation. No, they were a people that God had chosen to say, I will make you a people. Just like God has chosen you to say, I will make you a people. Now, you have people that are your brothers and sisters that you didn't know before. They're your brothers and sisters because you've been adopted into the family of God. You've been brought together into a body of believers, into this thing we call Christianity, into this world we call Christendom, into those that are seeking after to follow Jesus. And so, Paul, knowing that, wrote to and was sent out to those that didn't understand some of the history of where they come from, so he could explain to them where they're going, because he had spoken to God about this new way of knowing God that Jesus had brought, and he was called to do these things to the Gentiles and to the Jews, so that there would be this continuing growth of this new sect of Judaism that would eventually become split off from that which was to that which is today which we look at Christianity, and it's not really much Judeo-Christianity, although it tries. It's pretty much Christian way of looking at things. It's kind of like a, people doing what they think is right, according to the Word of God. Not too many people look at, you know, like Judeo-Christianity today and say, well, I'm Judeo-Christian. But Paul in Colossae, Paul in Colossians, reminds us of the things that we need to learn from our heritage, and how we don't need to be led by them, or structured by them, or shaken up by them, but we rather learn from them that they are just a part of our heritage. They aren't dictating to us what we should do. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging him, and he would direct our path. We can ask God to lead us, and that's what God has done. And so Paul is going to address some issues that have come into the church that today affect you and I right now. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you have a tradition of going to church on maybe midnight mass, or maybe you have confession, or maybe you have some kind of Protestant version of that, or maybe some evangelical way of doing the same thing. You may not admit it, being an evangelical, that you're like the Protestants, and being a Protestant, you're not going to admit like you're the Catholics, and the Catholics don't admit they're like the Jews. But if you look at the cord of truth that goes through all of them, they're all the same thing, just reworked in a different way to practice religion in some way that leads us to a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have a relationship with the Son, you can ask him anything you want and he will speak to you. God said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. So we've asked God to lead us by his spirit. We've asked God to teach us and what he's going to instruct us in are those traditions that we don't have to follow but they were there to instruct us in some ways. So let's read the word today and see what it is that God would speak to us that we can apply to our life right now, where we're living, as we're living, the way we're living. And so in verse 16 it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. They are a shadow of things to come, but the fulfillment or the body of it is of Jesus. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshy mind, and not holding the head from all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increased with the increase of God. Boy, won't that be fun to explain, huh? <laughs> Wherefore, if you be dead with Jesus, from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honoring to the satisfying of the flesh. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which are Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father, and set your affections on things above and not on the things of the earth. And so we'll stop there in Colossians 3.3. 3. It gets interesting because the sum and the total of the overview of all of it is simply, why are you doing what you're doing? In other words, if you got a reason to do what you do, then do it. Pretty simple. If you talk to God, pretty simple, and God's talked to you, not so simple, and you have decided together to do something, yeah, that makes sense, then you go forward with doing what God told you to do. Oh, is that what he's saying? Yeah. Because, you see, if you decide in the world to do the things of the world, then with the world you're participating. So whatever the world gets from it, you get from it. You've received your reward. You could say you've received your reward, <laughs> so to speak. But seriously, you reap what you sow. In other words, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. If you sow to the spirit, you'll reap of the spirit. A lot of times people say that, but they don't know what that means. So how do you make that practical? Well, there are things that are beneficial to you that, you know, are going to help you. Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So if you go out and buy a gun, you're liable to get killed by a gun. Because, frankly, someone will probably take the gun away from you and shoot you. Or they'll know you have a gun, and they'll break into your house, steal your gun, and shoot you on the way. Or some other situation where you'll pull the gun, and somebody will see you have a gun and shoot you for it, like police officers. Or, you know, in some way, some accident will happen, and by that, same thing. Jesus didn't necessarily say to you that you have to sacrifice your quote-unquote Christian liberty that you think you have in America under the law of American Christianity, which says America was made by God and God gave us the Constitution and, you know, our founding fathers were all Christian. Well, no, but Jesus said things that supersede America, that in other words, they came before America was ever conceived of. And America isn't in the Bible, but God is. And what Jesus said was that pretty practical information we can use every day. 
hey, you live by it, you die by it. So if you live by peace, you'll die in peace. If you live by love, you'll die in love. If you live by joy, you'll live in, you'll die in joy. So I personally think peace, love, and joy is a great way to go. You may want to protect yourself, so you have to live under protection. Okay, you know, me, God protects me. If you need to live by fear, then, you know, God will let you live by fear, but you don't have to. There is, as God said, and Jesus has taught us, a more excellent way. We can live by the things he has said, as opposed to the things that man has bred. In other words, man breeds things. He plants things, he sees things, he says things, and he says, well, I did that, so I think this is the way it works, because he did it. We call that mammon and man-made. Mammon and man-made are the same thing, believe it or not. They really are. Whether you conceive of that as being money or whether you conceive free enterprise or democracy or self-governance or individuality or personal freedom, freedom of rights, the fact is God wants you dependent. He doesn't want you independent. Satan is independent, and yet he's still dependent because everything comes under God. God is still in control no matter how you look at it. And Job discovered that the hard way. The fact of what God was doing was revealed to us, but Job didn't know what he was going through. And the same thing is true with us today. There is an end coming to what is happening in the world. The civilization that mankind has done under his own way and his own means and his own inventions is coming to an end. The end of the age is fast upon us because Israel became a nation. We are going to see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords return, and he's going to judge the world for its ways. What we see as if you live by the sword, die by the sword, you'll be rewarded by the sword. Be very careful where you put your stock and trade in. And so what God wants us to recognize is that we're not to be judging or judged by some of the things we do, but find mercy and grace by judging ourselves. Because if we do judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Let a man judge himself, lest he be judged. And so, in some ways, Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged, for with what manner you judge, you shall be judged. In other ways, we discern what we should be doing, and we understand that in one way, we do want to judge ourselves so that we could have mercy and grace. But if we do judge others, hey, the standard you use, you put you so. So it fits together. And that's what is... Paul's trying to say in Colossians, as we go through it verse by verse, it all fits together, but you can't have it conflict with each other. Because any portion of scripture that you see in here that conflicts, it's your understanding that's that conflict, not the word of God. It all works cooperatively together. If you ever have a question, you can call me sometime, you know, and talk about it. You know, I have, I'm pretty much open to that, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe a long conversation, but, you know, we'll stick with scripture, you know, but... In verse 16, it says, let no man therefore judge you, because the therefore talks about what was before, and he talks about in verse 14, the blotting out of the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out on the way, out of the way, nailing it to his cross. In other words, everything that was against us, the law, our separation from God, anything that possibly could have stopped us from having a personal relationship with Jesus or with God the Father, was nailed to the cross. Jesus took care of it. So then because he took care of it, he spoiled, as it says in verse 15, principalities openly triumphing over them in it. Meaning that everything that was against us, Satan is already conquered. The enemy is already done. The battle is already won. Jesus has done it all. Jesus has openly conquered everything we're going against that we think we have to fight. There's no battle. The battle's been won. Jesus has done it. Jesus has received the reward for it, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, watching whether we will accept the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law, the fulfillment of all our works, the fulfillment of the good news that we should be declaring to everyone. Look, you don't have to work. You don't have to be a worker of Judaism. As it says, like down here, I guess in verse, uh, oh, I don't know, 16, when it says, and judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or the Sabbath days. Judaism had lots of very good things to set up a society. As a matter of fact, a Jewish society is a very good society, at least the Old Testament version of it. 
Now, if you go to Israel today, not so good. You may think that it's a democracy, not so much. You'll see that there's a lot of manipulation, a lot of corruption, a lot of things underneath the surface that go on. You won't hear about, but it goes on. Until you live there, you don't know what goes on there. And that's what's true just about anywhere. But God said that when he came into the world to bring light, men love the darkness when they love the light. And that's why Jewish culture in Israel is anti-Christian. They don't want Christians coming in to evangelize any Jew. As a matter of fact, it's against the law to witness to a Jew in Israel. If you do, you will be asked to leave. You cannot live in Israel and evangelize or proselytize a Jew. It's against the law. Now, you may hear Jewish organizations wanting money from you saying, oh, well, you know, we, we, uh, you know, like we, we need your money so that we could be, you know, after all, we're, we're the children of Israel. We're the children of Abraham. We want your money. You know, we like you, Christian, but you don't realize that at the same time they take the money, they also say, no, 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 we're not following you because a Jew is for a Jew. They're not about Jesus. And that's why the fact of what God's going to do to Israel is sad when he sends Moses and Elijah into the temple area to testify against Israel of what they're doing. I mean, at the time now, fortunately, God is working again with those that are not in control, but rather the poor people, the shepherds that were out tending their flocks, the people that are looking for God coming, the people that want to know, where is this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we don't even believe God exists anymore? And yet they're a nation. And so God sends Abraham and, or God sends Moses and Elijah to testify of the law of the prophets of what they did not believe. And they probably started Genesis and worked their way through to Revelation. Then they get killed. <laughs> and then they get raised from the dead, you know, and their testimony is done. But the fact of the matter of having the children of Israel as our example or witnessing to or standing with Israel is false. You don't stand with Israel. You stand with what God said. And what God says, we accept. So when we bless people, we bless people just like we bless the children of Israel. If you bless the apple of my eye, you bless those that God has died for. God died for the children of Israel. God died for you and I. God died for the sinners. The people that you are fighting against or that you may hate or you may think of as being the enemy, Jesus loves. God so loves. God wants us to share the good news of. God doesn't want us to get caught up in righteousness because he's already spoiled principalities in verse 15. He's already taken care of everything that we need to do. So he says, let no man judge you. But at the same time, we should say, let us judge no man. You see, if we reverse the order, we always get better understanding sometimes of what we should be doing. Because don't let anyone judge you, but you don't judge anyone else. It says, let no man judge you in meat. So you don't judge someone else about meat, meaning that, if you say that you like kosher meat, well, then eat kosher meat. If you like McDonald's, eat McDonald's. Don't judge them. Let them eat it. Give blessings and thanks. Oh, God, thank you for my McDonald's dollar menu. Man, I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for that. And as a matter of fact, I still like McDonald's dollar menu more so because they've added more. I like it. I love it. I live it. You know, that I enjoy. Have I been kosher in the past? Sure. Did I enjoy it? It's expensive. <laughs> no, thank you. I like being cheap. It says, let no man judge you and drink. Hey, if you're an alcoholic, don't drink. But if you're not an alcoholic, don't worry about it. That's the point. It's not drink as though it were water or juice. We're talking about let no man judge you and drink because in the Roman world, drinking wine is common. In Europe, it is common. In Israel, it is normal. Everywhere else around the world that doesn't abuse it quite so much, it's pretty common. But in America, it's pretty abusive. And so we have people that can't handle alcohol. So on the one hand, don't judge the alcoholic. But on the other hand, don't you get caught up either. In other words, if you are a drinker, don't worry about it. If you don't drink, don't worry about it. In other words, it's not the important part of what's going in, but the things that come out of a man that judge him. It says, in respect of holy days. Some people think that every day is a holy day. Some people think that Saturday is a holy day. Some people think that Sunday is a holy day. God set up seven holy feasts, you know, and certain days for holy days, but that's what he did with the children of Israel. How you choose to use that is up to you and God. But 
Again, you don't judge them and they don't judge you. With whatsoever measure you judge, you shall be judged. So don't judge a person according to the days. Every day the Lord has made. This is the day we will rejoice and be glad in. That's why we can celebrate Christmas. That's why we can celebrate Hanukkah. We can celebrate Kwanzaa. We can celebrate you know, Halloween if you want to. I mean, you know, frankly, you can do whatever you want to. Don't let any man judge you according to these days. That's not important. It's not the day, but who's in it. Who made the day? God did. Satan didn't make the day. Satan can't take the day away from God. This is the day that the Lord has made. That's why, on the one hand, we share the good news, the glad tidings of, you know, Christmas season and say, yeah, celebrate Christmas, enjoy it, pray, praise the Lord, and keep right on studying the Bible. Because every day is the Lord's day. Every day is a day that God has made. So we will continue on to do that. We treat each day the same, New Year's same way. You know, we just keep on going. Go through the Word of God, understand the Word of God, live with the Word of God, because Jesus is the Word of God. So the more that we get of the Word of God in us, in some ways, we get Jesus. Pretty simple, really, once you figure it out, if it's done by the Spirit of God. And it says, or of new moons. New moons are great, you know, if you're Jewish, but, you know, I mean, and most Christians don't understand what a new moon is, you know, much less a full moon, you know, I mean... Most police officers and, you know, people that live in the health industry, they understand what a full moon is. People get crazy. Well, a new moon is when, frankly, in Jewish culture, you celebrate a new month or you celebrate the born again. The new moon is often called the Feast of Born Again. It's the time when no man knows the day or the hour, so to speak. And it's a different kind of, it's called Rosh Kodesh, of the head of the month. So it's kind of interesting when you start talking about, you know, the rapture or you start talking about, you know, no man knows the day of the hour, that there are also feasts that are called that. There are also days that are called that. There are also certain celebrations in Jewish culture that are called the expressions that Jesus used, but Jesus meant that, yeah, you don't know the day of the hour, but he gave a hint. So I don't know what to tell you, but <laughs> within three, seven, or a week, or ten days, there's pretty much a time frame you can know when you know the Lord's coming. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you need to study that on your own. I'm not going to get into something that, you know, we're not studying right here in Colossians. 3, 7, or 10, guess what? That should give it away. So you got, you know, kind of like a 72-hour window, 72, 24, 48, 96, 92, 92-hour window. Something like that. 72-hour window. Yeah, 72. 48, how do you get 48 and 24 to get 90? 72-hour window, three days. It's interesting, three and a half days, three and a half years, you know, interesting, three days, three nights, you know, kind of hint, 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 might want to study that. But, hey, you know, if you don't want to know the day or the hour, the times or seasons, you know, you just want to go on pretending that the rapture is not going to happen, fine, praise the Lord, you know, five wise, five foolish, go away, <laughs> knock yourself out. <laughs> Most of us are getting ready. <laughs> and it says, so... Or the Sabbath days. And, you know, you, there's nobody that, you know, I mean, the, the Sabbath keepers today, you know, really want to make things out to be legalistic more than what they'll admit. And unfortunately, there's a benefit to a Sabbath, you know, and it's a good idea to rest. But, you know, Paul said, will you enter into our rest in the millennium? You know, we'll rest when it's time. But it, while it's the day, we work it in the day. And Jesus said, while it's night, then they won't be able to work. So while it is day, we'll work. And that's what God has given us, a time to work. The day will come when we will rest. And we will enter into his rest. Most of us have entered into his rest now that we don't have to work. We don't have to do anything. We know that Jesus has accomplished it all. It is finished. It is accomplished. And that Sabbath was a representation of what God had finished the work of creation. God had finished the work of salvation. Both apply. So we now are into the rest of trusting in his accomplished work. We get to rest from our labors. Rest from our work. What we do now, we do out of joy, out of celebration, out of reward, out of expectation that the master is coming back, that he's going to reward us for what we've done with what he's told us to do in the name of his son. Looking at verse 17, we realize when it says they're a shadow of the things, you, you kind of got to think about that sometimes and make yourself understand more of how the word really does apply to the word. I mean, the shadow of things to come. It doesn't mean they're a type. It doesn't mean they're a metaphor. It means simply this. Put your finger here, shine a light on it, and the back part is the shadow. That's the part that is the new moon, the Sabbath, the things. You saw the shadow of it, but what you want to get to see is the person itself, or what it really means, or what's really in front of the light. 
So the shadow is what's behind. What's in front is what you want to see. It's really pretty simple when you think of it that way, because then if this, the shadow, is what we say in the physical realm, types, metaphors, similes, analogies, symbolic points, uh, way markers, um, the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not yet seen, the, the, the looking through a glass darkly, all these different things that we use scriptures in order to identify. Then, if you want to recognize what all these do, they point to, because there's they're a shadow, there's something in the way. There's something standing here. Something that is what? Casting the shadow. That is Jesus. It is the fulfillment of God revealing himself to us. Jesus. So if you want to know the substance of the things of the shadow, you go to the source that's stopping or the source that's blocking or the source that is casting the shadow. Jesus is the fulfillment of the volume of the book. You pick up a Bible and you put it like this in front of a light, it'll cast a shadow back there. That shadow will look like the form of a man. It'll probably look like the form of a cross, but, you know, the form of a man works too. Either way, you'll see that it's all about Jesus. That's why we say that. That's why we use those kind of cute little expressions, you know, to say, well, you know, it's just a picture of Jesus. It's a type of Jesus. It's an anthropomorphism. It's a... a um, pre-existent, pre-incarnate version of Jesus. You know, what I mean? All kinds of words we use to explain something we don't really understand completely. But that's what it means about a shadow of things to come, but the body of it is of Christ. In other words, the fullness of it is Jesus. The body of it is about you and me knowing Jesus. It is the accomplishment of what Jesus has done and caused us to come to understanding who he is, how he is, the way he is. He has caused all of us that call upon the name of the Lord to be saved so that we would become jointly one body, one family, one church, one faith, one baptism, one hope, one calling, following the one that we know, Jesus. And that's why it says down here, it gets interesting because we could skip ahead to verse 19. It says, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered, and knit together increases with the increase of God. In other words, in verse 19 is describing your body. I mean, you know that your body, you eat, that body makes you get fat. You know, you get fat. If you exercise, you take that fat, you make it strong. You make it can become muscle tone as opposed to fat tone. You know that different things that you eat are good for you or bad for you. You know, if you don't get enough water, you're going to get dehydrated. You don't get enough meat, you're going to be protein deficient. You don't get enough sugar, you're going to be, you know, um, hypoglycemic, you get too much sugar, you're going to be um, um, diabetic. You know, all these different things have an effect. The same thing is true with your mind, is that the chemicals that are in your brain, if they don't balance out with fluids and with certain certain um, nutrients, then you're not firing on all symbols, you know, or all, on all neurons. You know, you have like pistons, as it were, in there that are firing, or spark plugs in there that are firing off, and they go between each other that connect the dots, you could say, that they don't connect like this, touching each other, but they're just that much apart. And then this little spark goes across, and that's your thought. That's the thought process. You have billions, well, millions of neurons in there, or maybe billions, neurons in there going, you know, that's why you have this glow kind of about you when people look at it, they see this kind of light. And some people talk about the electromagnetic thing, you know, and all that stuff. Well, you know, it's just kind of part of the electrical pulse that, Part of who you are and what you are is the fact of the physical body that you live in. And that physical body, because it receives nutrients, it is all working together. That's why I can move my hands, I can move my mouth, I can talk, I can think, I can function. Now, I can't function spiritually unless I'm born again spiritually. And that's what we're talking about when it gets into the increases with the increase of God. Because if you looked at the entire body of Christ, the more that it knows about Jesus, the better it works together. When we keep our focus on God, then we work together cooperatively. When we take our focus off of God, then we no longer work together. My body can't work correctly unless it acknowledges itself. I can't go out and say, hey, you know what, I don't need the church because the church is the body. I can't go out and say that the church doesn't need me because I am the body. In other words, we are all together in this together. And whether we grow in God or not depends upon how much of knowing Jesus we grow into serving one another, loving one another, fulfilling the destiny that God has called us to, 
to accomplish the purpose that God has said. And that's why Paul's writing to the Colossians. He wants them to fulfill everything that God wants for them. To grow up stronger, more increased in the knowledge of God. Living the example of what Jesus said. Even as the disciples, when they first started off with Jesus, didn't know who he was. They wanted to control him at times. They wanted to tell him what to do. Jesus didn't let them. As a matter of fact, that's why Jesus is called the head in verse 19 and not holding the head. In other words, we can't control who's in charge. We don't have the authority. We're not the ones that are in control of our circumstances. As a matter of fact, we're told to trust in the Lord with all our heart, our life, our being, our will, our way. And we're supposed to ask God for everything that we do each day. James 1.5 if any man lack wisdom, let him ask a God of great thought, but give it to all men liberally. So, when we see that the body joints fits together, then, of course, it would be stupid to argue with other people, like it says in verse 16. It would be stupid for us to argue with other people. Why argue with your part of the body? Why does the thumb argue with the toe? Why does the toe argue with the mouth? Why is the tongue, you know, lashing its, you know, teeth? Rather, all of it should be jointly working together for the accomplishment of knowing, as it says in verse 19, by way of the increase of the knowledge of God or the increase of God. God increasing us. God causing us to bear fruit. God causing us to know him. God causing us to understand how we fit together. And so we see Paul teaching us basic theology, basic practical knowledge, really, from 16 all the way through to 23. But it says, wherefore, if you be dead with Jesus from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Why are you getting caught up in politics? Why are you getting caught up in issues? Why are you fighting whether somebody gets hired by A&E or fired by A&E? When did the football player become the hero of the faith? When did it become so important that we know what's happening in our government? Why is it such an important thing for you personally to have a personal opinion about the world when God is in control? Who sets up kings and who places authorities? According to Job, God does. Who has set the prince in his place? Who has taken the king's heart and turned it any which way he chooses? According to Proverbs, God does. Who can control the princes and the powers of the air? Who can literally stop the world from turning on its axis? Who has taken the course of the sun and moved it backwards in its track? God has. What are you doing with the world? Why are you involved in the world? Why do you think that signing a petition, objecting to some choice that God has made in order for some man to learn a lesson, are you involved in these things of the world? Why is the rudiments, the very nature, the very practical things of free enterprise and job market and health care and wealth care and, you know, celebrating this or doing that. Why are you involved? Why aren't you doing what Jesus said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Are you really supposed to get involved in all these other things? Do you really care that people are dying and going to hell? Is there something more about your life than eat Drink, be in charge. For all these things do the Gentiles seek after, Jesus warned. Are you a Gentile? Have you become, like the Colossians, more of a Roman and not knowing God than knowing God and following the body of Jesus, the body of Christ? What are we to be doing? Is our worldview one of being consumed with our nation and patriotism and making it a Christian nation? of trying to rewrite history to say our founding fathers were inspired by God in order to start a nation so that they could send out missionaries? Or was it rather monetary gain in some ways and others were penal colonies? And there's quite a bit of mixture of what the nation was started as, like any other nation. The only nation I know of that was started by God is literally when God said to Abraham, I will make of you a nation. And we're told that we are the children of Abraham if we are following his nation, not Jewish, but being sons of Abraham, being followers of the faith that Abraham had in God, so that we don't follow a nation, but we follow a kingdom. 
a kingdom that will have no end. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What good will it do if you would gain the whole world and lose your very soul? What good will it do if you gain Chick-fil-A to win their court case and lose your soul? What good will it do if you win your battle with A&E and lose your soul? In other words, your emotions is your soul, and have you fought against the people Jesus died for? Are you witnessing to these people of the love of God that he has for the whole world, that he gave his only begotten son? Are you losing your soul in politics, as most Christians do? Are you losing your soul in fighting battles in faraway lands, as you seek to serve your country? Maybe God didn't send you. Maybe your country sent you to kill in the name of God, or to kill in the name of country, or to kill in the name of freedom? I'm sorry. Jesus said it is finished. You don't have to kill anyone. As a matter of fact, the church itself proved through 300 years of its early history, you don't have to touch anyone. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that it says, touch not, taste not, handle not. What are you worried about? What are you really caught up about? Are all these things so important of the world that you think that practically you have to live in a practical world that you can't involve God intervening in that world? Because that's what, frankly, Paul is trying to warn the Colossians. Why are you doing your new moons? Why are you doing your Sabbaths? Why are you caught up in holy days? Why are you caught up in politics? Why are you caught up in the world and its ways? Why? I got news for you. Behold, born unto you this day in the city of David, the paradox, the absolute absurdity of all humanity come formed in the godliness of holiness that is made manifest in a baby that rules the universe because of what he's done. Now that doesn't make any sense at all. So the next time that you think you have to do all these things, remember how God does things. He doesn't do it through strength of arm. He doesn't do it through revelation. Oh, he will do all these things. Don't get me wrong. You will see the power of God, the nature of God, and the revelation of God in the book of Revelation when he peels back the sky, the heavens, but the sky too. And those that are alive and living on this planet at that time will suddenly realize, oh my God. And I thought I was protected with my guns. I am helpless, defenseless, and I will cry out to the rocks to cover me. And they will scurry like cockroaches into the caves. All of them. Everyone. Because they can't stand to see the holiness of God revealed as now heaven is very obvious to the planet Earth. That's terrifying. That's the fear of the Lord. That's the fear of God. We should not be into these things which are all to perish, as it says in verse 22, with the using, but after the commandments and doctrines of men that are all passing away. When you put all these things, the Constitution of the United States of America, barely 200 years old, 220, 30, 40 years old, compared to the Bible, excuse me, compared to what Jesus said, hello, compared to the fact that we live in the last days and that Jesus is coming we will see his return? What difference does it make? Who's got health care? I've got eternity. Do you have eternal salvation? Is your health care paid for by Jesus Christ? Are you paid by the blood of the Lamb, which according to verse 14 has been taken care of, nailing it to his cross? In other words, all things have been brought subject to him, as Colossians is telling us, because he has won the battle. He has declared to us what our eternal reward will be, what our salvation has become. And it's not about those things which are a show of wisdom in worship or humility or s neglecting the body or honoring and satisfying the flesh, as it says in 23, but they are all to perish, as it says in 22, that all of these things are going to pass away, that 
the commandments of the church, the commandments of people, the commandments of your government, the commandments or the ordinances of same-sex marriage or the silliness of civil law or civil unions or legal unions, those are passing away. Those are not what Jesus said today. Jesus speaks to you today in a very personal way. He says, look, if you are, as it says in verse 3 or verse 1 of chapter 3, if you are risen with Jesus, then you know what you ought to do. You should seek those things which are above where Jesus is seated on the right hand of God and set your affection on things above and not on the things of the earth in verse 2. Shouldn't you? I mean, or should you? You decide. You make up your mind today. Mary and Joseph could have looked at the three wise men and said, hey, you know what? Thank you for the money, honey. Thank you for the you know nice smelling perfume. Thank you for the you know myrrh. You know, thank you for you know like baby food, whatever. You know, we'll figure that one out someday. <laughs> whatever it really was all for. But thank you for all these things. But you know, we kind of like it here. We're just gonna stick around and see if really anything happens to us. You know, yeah, you know, Joseph's had a few dreams, but I ain't going. I'm sticking it out. I'm staying here. And then you'd find out what happens, because they were warned. You, today, are warned. You have a blessing to enjoy the season. You're told you don't got to be caught up in the fight for Christmas. Christmas happens. You don't have to be caught up in the world with its buying and selling. You can enjoy it. If you want to buy, you buy. If you want to sell, you sell. If you want to work at one job, you work there. If you want to work at another job, you work there. God said he'd provide. God said he'd take care of you. God said he'd be with you. God said he has given you all these things. He told you something as a warning, though. He says, if, if you are risen with Jesus. Now, I don't know if you are. If you are risen with Jesus, if you have God in your life, if you are born again, then seek those things which are above. Whoa, that's not very practical. Well, it all depends on how you look at it. If you want to be practical, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Oh, all what things? Yeah, those things. The world, the rudiments of the world, the Christmases, the Hanukkahs, the Halloweens, the partying, the whatever. You may not party in the same way, but God will turn it upside down and show you a way that's better for you to party. You may be drinking and you may find yourself having given up alcohol to get back alcohol to enjoy it. It's amazing how you can if you had temperance or you had the ability to not be led by your flesh, but rather led by your spirit. It's funny because, you know, it's amazing to me how all these things could be added back unto you if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, the three wise men did that. They sought first the kingdom of God. They were looking for signs in the heavens, and they saw them, and behold, they found the king. What are you looking for today? Are you looking for the world? I mean, be honest, you know, you can be truthful, you can be practical, you can be pragmatic about it. Are you looking to butter your bread, you know, get your car, have a house, build a little family nest egg, you know, have all these wonderful little, you know, toys and boys and girls and kids and life and you know, the enjoyment of the good life. Do you want all those things, you know, and you want to play, you know, Wix and, or Wix, you want to play Wii and, you know, Xbox and, you know, Warcraft. Well, of course, Warcraft's old news nowadays, but, you know, Warcraft from the old days and all these other games. And you want to go to the gym, you know, and you want to be the soccer mom or the, you know, the football dad. You want to have your cave, you know, you want to have your Christian cruise, you know, you want to have your ministry, you want to have your church, you want to have your life, you want to have all these things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now, I will tell you, if you do seek ye first the kingdom of God, there's a king in the kingdom. There is a person who's going to tell you what to do, and you have a choice to obey or disobey. To listen and learn, or to ignore and yearn for that peace of God to be in your life. Because the fact of the matter is, when you seek first the kingdom of God, you don't really care about all these other things. These other things are passing away and the lust thereof. Your flesh, if it be dead with Christ, will be risen with him by your spirit and it will suddenly realize, I don't really care about the new Harley. I don't really care about the new gym or the new, the new Jeep or the latest, greatest, you know, version of some truck. 
you know, or some pull package or some lift kit. I don't really care about, you know, designer jeans. As a matter of fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the less important those things become. And you want to be like the wise men. You want to give away what you got from the back days of your flesh. You want to give to God something important, something that meant something to you. You want to give away your gold to Jesus. You want to give your frankincense to Jesus. You want to give your myrrh to Jesus. You want to be a wise man if you are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But if you're not seeking first that, then you are going to be like those who stayed in Nazareth. Those who stayed in Bethlehem, those who stayed in Judea, because what's going to happen, and I'll tell you in a few short years, you will see your children die. Literally. The world will come after your children first. And they already have. They started and begun to. They come after them in perversions. They come after them in education. They come after them in separating you from your God-given authority to raise up children after God's way and God's will with God in you, teaching them the way that they should go. Because they are a blessing from the Lord. They're given to you as a blessing and you've chosen to use them as a curse. So are your children a blessing or a curse? The question is yours. How do you raise them? How have you taught them? They are the product of your faithfulness or faithlessness to following Jesus. The world wants your children. And they'll take them from you. They are going to be slaughtered of the innocents soon because Jesus is coming again. And just as he came in the first way with the star and the wise men and people were working and suddenly, you know, there will be two in the field. One shall be taken. One shall be left behind. Suddenly there'll be two at bed. You know, one shall be taken. One shall be left behind. Suddenly the Lord will call and some will say, well, you know, I can't come right now. I got to take care of my debts. I can't come right now. I got too many busy things to do. I've got my house to take care of. I got my car to take care of. I got my other things to take care of. And God will call, but you won't hear. God will speak, come up hither, and you won't know it's time to go. You'll not recognize the signs of the times that you live in because you have not sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So the choice is yours. You can listen to the word at this season of angels opening up the heavens and be found watching the miraculous happen every day and seeing God speaking to you today. Or you could be like those that were in the city, never knowing that God was born that day in the stable because he's outside the city. He's outside of your comfort zone. He's out doing or out being where God wanted him to be. May I say to you, be careful. That might be a picture of your church. Jesus warned the letters to the seven churches that there were some that were faithful. They were going into great tribulation. They were going to suffer. Read them. Some were going to be cast into some tribulation. Read it. Some were going to be found to be faithful that were loving and they were going to be taken away. The real determination, if you look at every one of those churches, isn't so much about what they did or didn't do, but the love that was inside of them. Did they actually accomplish what God had told them that he could do in their life? Did they give up their soul for the sake of following other things? Or did they gain their soul by giving up other things? In other words, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world or if he gain whatever situation you have in your life today and lose your soul. Father, I pray that today we might give our soul, our heart, our will, our way, our spirit, our mind to you. We don't want our feelings to mislead us because it is a time of the season when we can be misled. We don't want our temporary joy of buying presents to get us caught up with the absence of the presence of your spirit. Rather, God, we want you to give us your good gift of eternal life. You have given us grace. You have given us mercy that we should extend that at this time of the year. That we should be able to proclaim with the angels glad tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all men, for born unto all of humanity in this day, and as it had been in the past, is Jesus. That he could be born again in the hearts of those who would call upon his name and be saved.
that they could seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things would be added unto them, that they could deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus, and find in that resurrection from their old life a new life that will begin, that they could be born today, not of the flesh, but of the spirit, and that there would be a light springing forth, and that wise men would bring them gifts, Wise men would bring them gold that had been purified. That wise men would bring them frankincense and prayers. That God would bring them myrrh from his word. That these things would be for the believer today, that they would be born like a baby. This day, even as Christmas is coming, that they would be that celebration of life that has sprung forth in the midst of darkness. Today, O oh God, I pray that these people may become your children, saved even as you sent your son into the world to save the world. Oh God, let us all find in these tidings of great joy, gladness and rejoicing. For behold, hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn, whether it be king or whether it be kings and priests. God, I pray today that your message would go forth and accomplish its purpose and its will, that you would say to the uttermost those that are lost and perishing even at this time and bless your people that they get not caught up, as we read in Colossians, into the rudiments of the world, and not caught up into holy days and Sabbaths and holidays and the things of the world, but rather, God, we could give you the world with our own hands and offer it up to you as a living sacrifice and say, thank you for letting us participate with you in declaring your word to this world, that you so love it, that you so die for it, that you have come and given it salvation in your son, Jesus. Amen. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and may the new year remind you of the year that you are going to see Jesus come. Because whether it be this year as it's ending, or the new year to come, or very soon after, Jesus is coming. Jesus is in us, but Jesus is coming physically. And he's calling those that are his own. May you find in your season of joy as you celebrate with your family and your friends and your neighbors and your relatives, or you are depressed and sad and beaten down and working in your job, may you find that in both, God is there. Whether you're a shepherd out in the field working your flock, or whether you're, you know, one of the poor people that, you know, were just hanging out in the shepherd's stables, you know, and suddenly discover, wow, what's going on over there? A baby born. Wow, that's different. Or whether you be wise and know the times and the seasons that we live in. I hope you see Jesus today. And I hope you celebrate him today.